Should we follow what the U.S. women's soccer team did with menstrual cycle tracking? Does the menstrual cycle increase risk of ACL injury? And should we take time off when we experience the negative symptoms of the menstrual cycle? So today we are going to answer some questions surrounding the female athlete menstrual cycle, as there are so many different myths out there, and we just want to bring some clarification today. So of course, I have Emily Neff back on the show to further explain and debunk some of these myths. So Emily, welcome back. Thank you so much. Super excited to be here. I always have to have you on for this topic just because you are so, so knowledgeable and you definitely are up to date on the most recent research surrounding the menstrual cycle. So we do have a list of myths and we're just going to run through them one at a time and just clarify for you guys what is true about the cycle. So the first one is should teams uh, track their cycles as a team? So that's one of the biggest myths that, oh, we should all get our girls on the same page. We should make sure that they're all going through similar phases at the same time so that we can periodize together. But why is this a, a myth, Emily? There seems to be this myth out there that women can sync their cycles together. And it's first anecdotal, you know, maybe you have a friend and you're like, oh man, we're getting our period at the same time. It's because we're syncing. And there's this belief that, you know, females emit like a pheromone and that's what's causing your ovary to release an egg at a similar time as my ovary. And when you look at the research, even though anecdotally it seems that way, it's just a mathematical equation. Um, so it, it's, has nothing really to do with hormones, like my hormones influencing your hormones. And instead it just has to do with, well, Women on average are going to get their period about, let's say, every 28 to 32 days. And when you pair a group of girls together over time, when you kind of look at that, the differential between the time in which you may get your period, maybe having some uh, period irregularities, some periods may seem like they're syncing up, but it's not, it's not because of this, like, you know, hormonal thing that's happening. It's just math. Um, it can happen. So to assume that your whole team is going to sync up is a really poor assumption because there's so many other variables that are affecting the menstrual cycle, such as the athlete's recoverability. Maybe she has an underlying condition such as PCOS or endometriosis, which is going to affect her menstrual cycle regularity. Maybe in regards to recoverability, she's under fueling. So there's certain periods when her training load spikes that her period starts to become really irregular or completely missing. So to create this assumption that females together will sync up, even though you may think you have seen it before, again, you're just seeing math at work. Um, so, which is really cool. That's how math works. It's just a law of probability. Um, but it's nothing hormonal or hormones aren't telling each other's hormones. So let's all ovulate together not a thing. So if we're trying to create a team training program around our menstrual cycles, one, that's going to be very difficult because you will never have an entire team on the same menstrual cycle. It's just not going to happen. Um, the odds of that are almost exponentially impossible. But then second to that, it's, if that is your goal, I think we have to look at the research and question why. Um, there's a lot of podcasts, people out there that like to say like, oh no, like she's about to get her period. So you are only using this type of fuel. So you should change your training to be more aerobic versus, uh, in the beginning you should, or your period just happened. Awesome. Now you're much more anaerobic. Now you can do more strength training where it's like, it's such minutia and it really has in the long term has very little effect of anything. It's not going to affect your training for especially the level of which we're talking about. Um, maybe you have an, an elite Olympic caliber athlete that has done everything else and you need that cherry on top. And it's possible that she can do a little bit more aerobic training closer to her period because she's just historically shown that she gets to get, she experiences more fatigue during that time. That's a great case for an individual, but it's not a case to be made for a team. If you look at the research, 
it is overwhelming that training around your menstrual cycle is not promoted. It is not scientifically supported. It has no actual carryover to performance. And instead, what needs to be done is we need to look at each individual and gauge how they feel. And that's what you should be doing anyhow. That's why a lot of training programs use uh, training parameters such as like rate of perceived exertion, RPE, because you have to measure how an athlete is feeling because now you need to know, hey, it's time for her deload or hey, she's feeling really great. We had planned deload, but she, her RPE is way lower than we had anticipated. We can we can keep peachy. She must be overreaching at this point. If you want to go through that individual aspect, that's great, but we don't really need to include the period with it. Um, especially because if you are an athlete, chances are with how math works, you will have to play a game when you have your period. And if we've trained months in advance, with the mindset of your period is coming, let's do less in anticipation of it. We have to make changes. You're feeling crampy. Let's let's make all of these changes. You have now set your athlete psychologically up for failure because she has not been prepared for that. Instead, your athlete is resilient. There's a very big reason that we have stopped the girls don't need to participate in gym class when they have their period decades ago because it's not necessary and it's actually causing more harm than good. We do not need our girls to train under a situation that they think that their period is making them more fragile. And because of that, we have to change our whole training program because when it comes time to compete, they're now ill-prepared. Instead, if we actually took our training and we went through an RPE module or we just used certain training parameters, we're like, hey, you're not feeling great today. What did you eat? What did you, how, did, how much did you sleep? And you just talked about the, the main components of recovery that we can control that will affect how we feel from our menstrual cycle. That is going to have such a greater carryover in the long term when it comes to now it's time to perform. Hey, you've been noticing that you're not feeling too great leading up to this performance. Cool. Did you sleep extra last night? Have you been on your hydration? Have you been eating? You've already given her these actionable steps that she can take. And now she's more prepared to perform um, versus if we did the opposite. That's so true. And it's, it's so important for athletes to be more proactive with the basics of good lifestyle habits, as opposed to being reactive and sort of tiptoeing around that menstrual cycle. And I, I want to just return back to the team tracking real quick. I, I always wondered why coaches wanted to get their teams on the same page. And I think this issue goes hand in hand with the periodization around the menstrual cycle. So say you get your entire team, they get the same phases at the same time, which is highly unlikely, but say it happens and they're all in their menstrual phase. Does that mean that week you're not going to play a competitive game or you're not going to have a high intensity practice three days before a game. You're just going to cut back on things overall and do that more light to moderate aerobic work. Is, is that what people are trying to do? Is, is, is that the goal of getting the team on the same page? Because it seems to me like we are coddling our female athletes to some extent. So what are your thoughts on that? I, I mean, I hate it because I think that it just, we're, we're putting we're putting females back to bring up again. We don't take girls out of gym class anymore because of their periods. We used to do that because that's what we thought. We thought that females were more fragile during their menstrual cycle. We literally thought that the ligament that held the uterus in place was more lax and therefore could snap and her uterus could fall out. And then science took over and was like, LOL, that's not what's happening. Her uterus is not going to snap out. Our girls are great. They can definitely keep being active. In fact, it's actually recommended that they still stay active because exercise has been shown to help reduce all of those not nice side effects that comes with getting menstrual cycles like cramps, low back pain, extreme fatigue. Instead, if we actually promote things that push blood flow and push actual activity, we're going to see better long-term experiences with the menstrual cycle versus if we do the opposite. So by saying that or your period is coming and now we have to make changes to your program makes me feel like we are we are just walking back decades in reverse 
And there is this saying in science that sometimes if too much information is bad information, because you don't know what to do with it. And it's like, I love the push for more females in sport. Obviously that is what I do, but we're doing a disservice to them. If we think that tracking their menstrual cycle means that we're actually educating them. It doesn't, we're not actually doing anything productive with it. Instead, we're now using information that we don't know what to do with it. And instead we're now reversing time and we're back to the gym class, take some time off days. And that has a long-term poor effect on our athletes performance. And in the grand scheme of things, if you look at, you've now added bigger spikes and valleys to your athletes training load. So she's training really hard but our periods here, and then you're going to stop, but then she has three games coming up and then you're going to peak her again. And you could have actually prepared her better for those peaks by modulating her training load instead of going from high to low to high to low. And now you've actually put her at a higher chance of injury again, not maliciously. That wasn't your intent, but we're using this data incorrectly. It's great to have conversations with your athletes about her menstrual cycle, because what's really the most important aspect is that, is she getting a menstrual cycle? Is her menstrual cycle so irregular? Big warning sign. She's at a chance of injury because it's irregular. That means she's probably experiencing reds. Maybe her period is extremely painful and heavy. You need to recommend she goes to a healthcare provider because that's not normal. It's not normal for someone's period to be so heavy that they need like 12 tampons throughout the day. That's not that's a signal that something is not going correctly. And that's when you have to talk to a doctor about that because there's so many underlying factors that are important for you to work with your athlete now so that it's not, you know, a disastrous issue when she's in her thirties and forties. So definitely pay it, use the data, but use the data to really track is she getting her period. Mm -hmm. Um, is it's a, it is a vital sign of the body, just like our heart rate, just like, um, our VO two maxes, all of these things tell us how our body is operating. Well, girls have an extra vital sign and it's called our period. And we get to see the regularity of our period is going to allow us to understand, Hey, is my athlete recovering? Mm -hmm. And if it's that, if it's not, that's like, that's your red flag. Hey, we got to talk about recovery. We got to figure out what her food intake is, what her sleep, what her stress levels are. How can we start managing this better? Because this is an important vital sign, but whether or not she's getting her, the timing of her period is not an important data point. I'm so glad you brought up the training load. And that's, that's one thing that is very dangerous about periodizing around the cycle is if we drastically drop that load during these weeks where she is experiencing negative symptoms and then we all of a sudden spike it the following week that's when injury occurs is is those huge highs and lows so that is a very important point to hammer home and keep in mind you guys and i i just find it so funny i think this applies more not to the athlete population but just to like regular adults because a lot of us have more time on our hands sometimes to maybe periodize around the cycle or to take days off. Maybe we can work from home. Um, but you know, realistically a working woman, you can't really take off or, or, or not go into work. If you're feeling crabby from your menstrual cycle <laughs> for me later this week, I have to travel and present at the coaches convention and I'm feeling extra sleepy this week and not great and actually very sick, but like, I'm not going to not go. I have a job to do. I have to, I have to present. So it's like, it, it doesn't apply to athletes and it doesn't really apply in real life either, unless your schedule is super flexible. So I just find it kind of funny. Or if you don't have kids, because what mom out there is like, oh, I can't take the kids to the park today. My period is coming and I'm just really feeling very fatigued. <laughs> Find me a mom that can do that because that right. just doesn't exist. That's yeah, that's so true. And it's like, I know like you, you should take care of yourself, but also realistically for the moms out there, it's like, you can't, you can't do that. You have to be selfless when you're a mom. Exactly. Um, and also exactly. you, you have to be selfless when you're an athlete. You can't just not show up to practice uh, when you have some of these negative symptoms. What you need to do is maybe fuel a little bit extra, maybe intake more protein to get better muscle recovery, stay extra hydrated during those times, go to bed 30 minutes earlier, do things to, to empower yourself so that you can still show up 
and and feel the best you can during that week. You might not feel like amazing, like you're, you're bouncing off the wall, super energized, but you can feel a little bit better than you normally do during some of those harder weeks by just fueling properly and and getting enough sleep. So, Absolutely. Uh, and then and then jump into your practice and see how you feel after because I guarantee you're going to feel better after versus if you just stayed at home. That's very true. And time and time again, I, I hear that from girls. They're like, oh, I don't feel up for it. I have so much homework or I feel tired. But then when they do stay home, they feel guilty. They feel ashamed. And it's like, Sometimes you just have to plow through and go, but still focus on really nourishing yourself and doing what you can control. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's go to the next one. Um, okay. So this one, I always get so many comments on, and I'm sure you do too, Emily, but this is the, one of the biggest myths, and there's a lot of nuances to this. So menstrual cycles increase risk of ACL injury because Uh. of more joint laxity. So why is this, why is this a myth and what do we need to keep in mind with this one? So we need to keep in mind that we have very little research that actually demonstrates this. In fact, uh, Mary Mata in 2022, a very recent um, research article looked at a group of females, whether ath- they grouped it between athletes and non-athletes, and they looked at um, ho- actual hormone levels. So they actually did a hormone analysis around a menstrual cycle, and then they measured ligament laxity. Um, and they looked at two groups, girls that demonstrated regular cycles and girls that demonstrated irregular cycles. The only issue or critical complaint of this article is that the girls that were demonstrating irregular cycles had a regular cycle at the time of the study. That's how they studied it. And when they looked at it, they saw over the course of the cycle, estrogen levels, progesterone levels changed as they should. But you know what stayed constant? Ligament laxity. But ligament laxity was a, was influenced by the level of activity of the athlete, meaning athletes that were more active had less lax ligaments because they were probably doing things that helped promote ligament stiffness, uh, such as perhaps strength training. Uh, And they looked at that over one course period of time. And what's really important in that in other studies, this is, uh, Quatman was, he wasn't the lead investigator. I always forget who it was, but Quatman, this was about 2012. He looked at, the difference of um, ligament laxity that happens over the course of puberty, because we know that female athletes, this disparity between male and female athletes and ACL injuries becomes most predominant during that pubescent period. So the initial claim is like, okay, well, girls have a big influx of estrogen. Estrogen makes everything super lax. And that's why girls start tearing their ACLs more frequently. Um, when they looked at this cohort of adolescent females that went through puberty, it was like a two year study. They looked at actually estrogen levels weren't like significantly different because you don't have this huge spike in estrogen. You're 11. You have, you have some, but it's not huge. But what did change was ligament laxity. But what they saw is that ligament laxity seemed to be more related to growth rate. So what they saw is that as females took their growth spur, their ligaments became more lax and compared to boys, this doesn't happen, but this is because girls and boys grow differently. When girls experience a growth, a growth spurt, their bones are going to grow at an exponential rate. And for that to happen without like their body snapping, their ligaments, that's what connects your bone to bone have to become lax and their tendons that attach a muscle to bone also have to become lax. So you can't have them too stiff. Your body's growing. But what happens during this time is their muscles don't grow at a concurrent rate. So that laxity stays with them. And that's when you might see girls that like, hey, she's so fast at like nine or 10. And then all of a sudden the next year, you're like, what happened? She's so slow. The amount of parents that are like, what happened to my kid? And I'm like, she's going through puberty. <laughs> like, this is normal. This is hundred percent normal. Keep on the path. Keep getting her strong. She doesn't need to do speed training right now. That's not, that's not going to help her get faster. It's because her bones have grown, but her muscles haven't caught up yet. Like she's 11. Let's Let's focus on the controllables and that's getting her strong and competent and not making comments over the fact that she's slower. Uh, 
she'll catch up. Like, let's be nice to each other. And in comparison to boys, boys are going to grow. Their bones are going to grow, but they have a concurrent increase in muscle. So that's when after puberty, boys are going to, you're going to see like, oh my God, he's so much faster. He's so much more powerful. And we have measurements in the lab that demonstrate this. We see that boys have increased power output measured through vertical jump height. They have naturally, they can dissipate forces and landing better than they did pre-puberty. And this is because as they grew, their muscles grew with them. So that laxity wasn't necessary in their tendons and ligaments. But girls, we see the opposite. We see their power outputs are unchanged, if not start to decrease. So they got bigger, but there was no, the motor to help that body move better isn't there. And that, that ground reaction force, again, is if not the same, if not bigger, because now their bones are bigger. They have a bigger mass, but they have less um, muscle that are going to help absorb that mass when we land. So that's what's really important when we look at this difference of injury rates that are starting to occur during puberty. It's less related to the hormones, the way that we think that it is. And actually it's more related to the fact that we grow differently. And if we don't give females the one tool that's going to help them kind of catch up. And when I say catch up, I don't mean that your daughter is going to look like your son. It's just not possible. Your, your son, you puberty happened. They started here. Your son is here. Your girl starts strength training. She'll be here. That's great. But your, your son will always be ahead. That's just how hormones work. That's how he had a big influx of testosterone. And that's why his body is built the way that it is. It's the, it's the spike of a certain hormone that affects things versus the a long-term level of it. And that's something we have to keep in mind. Girls actually have a lot of free testosterone within our bloodstream, but we don't have huge muscles that we can never put on a lot of muscle mass. I think at most we can put on maybe two pounds of muscle a year without any exogenous help. And that's with like effort. And that's maybe without any additional conditioning because conditioning is going to decrease the amount of muscle you can put on. It's just how this happens. So don't worry about your daughter getting bulky. It's not going to happen. Instead, what you're doing is you're helping basically improve her neuromuscular adaptations. And that just means that you're getting her muscles to grow a little bit faster in coordination with how much her body has grown. And that training is going to help get those tendons and ligaments stiffer. Your tendons and ligaments are responsive to load. So they can actually hypertrophy. They can get thicker. And if they're thicker, that means that they're going to be more resilient to load that we put on them. But if we keep if we keep driving home this idea that girls around their menstrual cycle are super fragile, we've now created more of a psychological issue than anything. Because again, we don't have research that's telling us this. In the past 20 years, when we've been looking at female athletes and why they keep getting injured, we would have found this out by now. And we would have found this out with very conclusive evidence. We would have been like, yes, look, all girls always tear the ACL at this time in the menstrual cycle. This is definitely linked to their hormones, but we don't have that evidence. And we've been looking at these different sex differences for almost over, over 20 years. And we're not seeing that. Instead, we're seeing, hey, there's something else to the equation here. It has more to do with these difference of growth and the fact that we're not treating our boy athletes and girl athletes the same. The boy athlete, you're more willing to get into the strength room than our female athletes. And that's important because strength training can reduce the, your chance of an overuse injury, such as a non-contact ACL tear, by 50% to an upwards of 68% in female athletes if you do it year round at about two times a week. And that's really what's most important. So talking about, well, when my daughter tore her ACL and she got her period the next day, if you actually want to make that claim, when your daughter has her period, her hormones are actually at its lowest state. Because when you have your period, your uterus is wiped free, that lovely um, lining. So your hormones have flat lines. So it's okay. So you're telling me your daughter has torn her ACL when her hormones have flat lines. So the hormonal claim doesn't make too much sense. Um, and then further to that, girls that don't have a regular menstrual cycle have flat lined hormones. It's the same thing. And we see girls that have irregular menstrual cycles actually have a higher chance of injury and a higher um, rate of injuries, even like ACL in tears. So again, if this hormone hypothesis were correct, we'd say, Hey, girls that don't get their period, 
man, they're resilient. They're never tearing their ACLs. But we see the opposite because there's way more to the story. Estrogen is not something to be vilified. It is not causing this extreme laxity that we are just breaking. Um, and then I always like to say in the grander scheme of things, if you look at hormonal changes across the menstrual cycle, it is nothing in compared to a female's hormonal changes that happen when she's pregnant. When she's pregnant, the changes in her hormones are way vastly different than they were. And we'd be saying pregnant ladies tear their ACLs left and right because pregnant ladies don't just like stop moving. They're not just like, okay, you're pregnant, you're in bed. We'd be seeing these knees popping and everything they do, but it's not directly linked to our hormones. And we can't keep making this claim because we're just running around in circles and not actually getting anywhere when we say it. That's so true. It's like everyone's just presenting this problem that w- is so inconclusive, but it, it it brings us back to what we should be doing anyway, because there's more research behind that. And that's strength training to improve stiffness of the joints and to really make those muscles durable to year round sports specific load. So it's like, why even tell female athletes, Hey, you might be at a higher risk. They're just going to psychologically be like, Oh my gosh, there's something wrong with me. And it might make her more hesitant when she's playing, or she might just feel timid and just like ashamed of like being a female, but it's like, no, do what you can control. Do what makes you stronger. Do what nourishes your body. Just come back to the basics because we know these help with sport performance and injury reduction. So I think with that myth, we can just scratch it all together and just don't even bring it up. And I I hear a lot of coaches, especially male coaches, feeling like they have to talk to their girls about the menstrual cycle. And I would say to these guys, look, at least educate yourself on what's true and what's not. And you don't even need to bring up periods to your team. That that can be very awkward and weird coming from a male coach to 12-year-old girls. Yeah. So you're you're better off as a male coach having a referral network of a strength coach to send your girls to having an RD to refer out to, and just having these tools in your toolbox, having team dinners where you have protein and carbohydrates and healthy foods that nourish your girls or having like team walks and maybe a recovery session, like do something that's not just having that direct conversation because it's just better to jump to the solutions for our girls that are empowering and not as awkward for a male coach. And this conversation may make more sense for adult athletes in the professional world. There are plenty of male sports scientists that can have these conversations, but obviously these are grown women and everyone's mature, but we probably don't want to be having this with a a 12 year old girl as a man. So what are your thoughts on this topic? Because I get a lot, I have a lot of male followers on this YouTube channel, so they're probably like leaning in. (laughs) Like, (laughs) I agree. I mean, we have to keep in mind too, these girls that are at this youth age, they just got their period. They don't know what it is like. They've gotten maybe three, maybe five total in their life. They're figuring it out. So they feel super awkward about it because they don't understand what's going on with their body. So you have to take that consideration. Also, most of these girls aren't talking to their dads about it. So I don't think that they want to talk to you as the male coach about it. (laughs) They're not talking to their dad about it. I don't think that they want to talk to you about it because they feel weird. And that's so normal. That's puberty. That's, that's, That's the name of the game. So instead, just like you said, having those conversations about staying healthy and how to recover and how to make sure that you're listening to your body. Maybe if you're super concerned with it and you really want to have a chat with it, have like a parent's night and you talk to the parents and just like, hey, it's really important to make sure your girls are getting regular periods if they if they haven't gotten it yet. But also keep in mind that after like your first year and a half of getting your period, most of their cycles will be irregular because their body's just figuring it out. So like, it's hard to kind of even say that it's like, hey, just make sure your daughter is sleeping and eating and getting enough protein. And if she's feeling super overwhelmed or she's feeling weird, like here are some resources that I, I really highly recommend that she can go to. She's always welcome to talk to me. Keep your door open. 
but don't force them in because it's just awkward for them. Um, and they don't want to talk to you about it. I'll never forget when I was, I think it was like 11 and I was like on a travel soccer team and our soccer coach like emailed our parents and was like, so I don't know, not all of you girls will be wearing, your daughters are wearing, uh, sport bralettes at this time but uh we have to change jerseys like in between games on tournaments so just can you make sure they have something on underneath them I remember my parents telling me that and I was so embarrassed because like I think I had like a little training bra at that point like I had, I had nothing to definitely did not go through puberty and even that was embarrassing for me um because <laughs> having like having an indirect conversation I was like oh okay I'll make sure that I wear it at all times um so keep I, I'll never forget that like looking back I have to laugh like that poor coach I was just like girls you need to be able to change <laughs> outside because there's nowhere for us to go um so that's even awkward so just keeping in mind like having parent conversation let the parents take the wheel with that that's their job your job is to focus on the sport give them good tools things to do but your job is not to talk to them about those things. Um, there's, it's still new to them. Let them figure it out. Let them become comfortable with it with themselves before you feel as though you have to have that conversation. Oh my gosh, you're right. It's, it is so awkward. And now like, I'm just having flashbacks to like even family life, that class in, I think it was middle school. And I remember learning about the menstrual cycle and they had a picture of like a uterus and the whole thing on the screen. I passed out. Like I fainted. (laughs) I'm such a baby with that stuff. Like I never could have been a medical doctor for that reason, (laughs) but like I literally passed out and had to go to the health room. And like, but like every like female has their experience with like learning about this and getting it for the first time. And more often than not, it's not like, we're not like excited about it. We're not like, oh, (laughs) yay. Like menstrual cycles here. And it's a thing. And we're more like, oh, what is this? This is so strange. So weird. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's it's so strange. Um, but yeah, we just have to remember where these girls are at in, in their journey and just really giving them the tools and, and being consistent with having these conversations about the tools. Uh, too often I like I love when coaches want like nutrition presentations or they want to have a strength coach get on Zoom with their team and talk about strength training, but it can't just be a once a year presentation, mm-hmm. a once a year nutrition handout with your club. It has to be weekly, if not monthly conversation. So please continue to have these discussions with your girls and teach them about the macronutrients and how they help with sport performance and injury reduction, teach them about proper hydration and fueling on game day or before game day and proper recovery meals. There's just so much to teach them on a regular basis. And I think repetition with that is so important and it's way better than saying, well, you just have an increased risk of ACL because yeah. of your menstrual cycle. Exactly. No, we're better off giving them tools and solutions. <laughs> Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Now I want to come back just real quick because I had a question about this. So with the, the training around the menstrual cycle. So I've heard people say that at certain phases in the cycle, there's more testosterone and it's peaking. So a female athlete is better off doing a three rep max that day or timing her max velocity sprints and doing more high intensity efforts to reap the most gains. What are your thoughts on this? (laughs) Um, well, the research really shows. And when I say research, I don't mean like one research article. I mean, like meta-analyses, which are reviews of multiple articles. We can't just look at one article. We have to look at the body of literature that we have. And the body of literature says that if there's any difference, it's so marginal marginal that it's almost undetected and it's really irrelevant. Um, if you're looking at testing your athlete, well, guess what? She's going to have a big competition when her period is coming. She's going to have a, another big competition when she's in her follicular stage. Like you can't, you can't decide that, oh, today's the best day to test her front spot because this is where she's at in her menstrual cycle. It's so marginal. And it is just a small key, a small factor that is more highly influenced by how's my athlete recovering? How did my athlete actually train? Did I peak her for this? Did I taper her? 
for this test that I'm going for, those are have a hot, much larger influence than anything else than the time of her menstrual cycle. And the small changes, the small changes in the grand scheme of things, these hormonal fluctuations that we have are very small. They're not huge. They are, they're, it's, it's, if you, if they were so big, we, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone affects so many other things. If we had such a huge spike of progesterone, all your glands would be swollen because it's in, in, inflammatory. So you'd be like, oh, well, she's in the second phase of her menstrual cycle. Look at her glands. They're huge. Like that would be, that would be more of a telltale that, hey, we should probably be more attention to this with training, but it's not because in the grand scheme of things, the hormonal fluctuations that we have are enough to, to cause what they need to in terms of ovulation, but it's not enough to influence all of these other body systems that these hormones can influence because the fluctuations are not large enough to actually have this long-term effect. Like I said, we'd be seeing it in other body systems, but our other body systems are not hugely influenced. They're not changing. Um, she, it's, it's just, it's just silly. Um, and it's just, again, we're using data and we're misinterpreting it. Yeah. And it's also like an athlete is way better off just reaping gains by doing year round consistent training two to three times a week. It's not Absolutely. going to be that, that one week in, in your cycle where you're going to get so insanely strong and fast. No, you're going to yeah. get strong and fast by consistently doing performance training year round. And I mean, there's so many benefits to that performance wise, but also just teaching your girls really good habits and just taking care of their bodies. And I, I just think like a lot of these studies, as far as periodizing around the cycle, they, they don't take into account all these variables of like girls we work with on a daily basis or girls in the the youth sports system. They're all from different uh, counties, schools. They have different academic loads, sleep schedules. There's just so much going into it that you, you can't like go or work around with, with your program. You just have to keep them on a consistent schedule. And if you three rep max during your menstrual phase, then whatever, if she's exactly. been training and has progressive overload and has accumulated good habits over time, she's going to do great on that three rep max, whether she's in her menstrual phase or her luteal phase, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't really ma matter. And you're right, Emily, the, the gains are just so, so marginal. And again, there's just, there's not enough research for us to know for sure, to change what we're doing. We're going to keep doing what we're doing and we're going to year round performance train and get these girls into good habits. Exactly. Absolutely. Let's come back to the, the growth spurt and the, the joint laxity. So yeah, the, we've done a podcast on PHB and what, what goes on, goes on during this time. But I, I think a lot of coaches and parents need to understand that if a girl is going to start performance training, this is the time to do it because when she's going through her most rapid period in growth, it's literally like putting a, a 10 pound weight vest on her and telling her to move efficiently and, mm -hmm. and as fast as she used to. So we, we want to make sure during this time we're, we're teaching her proper running form or how to decelerate and the, the movement patterns in the weight room so that she has good neuromuscular training and she reduces that chance of injury. So Emily, do you just want to expand a little bit further around the growth spurt and then we'll just wrap it up? Absolutely. I kind of love what you said with the weight vest. It's kind of like the equivalent equivalent of Let's say you have this like junky car and now you put an elephant on top. You're like, man, why is this junky car going faster? And you're like, well, did you change the motor? <laughs> did you, did you help give quality fuel? Like you haven't actually given the subs, the things that this car needs to actually move. You've just loaded her and her load is going to happen when she grows. Her bones are heavy. These changes are heavy. She's also going to start accumulating more water because she has different tissues developing in her body. And that means more water accumulation and water is still way something. So your athlete is physiologically changing. And that doesn't mean that she's like in, in a, like a poor inferior athlete compared to boys. 
our women's bodies have to do a lot. So it takes a couple of years to get them prepared for the things, the most amazing things that they could do. Cause Hey, without women, we wouldn't be here. So instead of looking at like, Oh, that's why, that's why women are inferior playing sports. It's like, no, we just have to play the long game. It doesn't, it just means that we are not going to peak when we're 15. It means that when we're 15, we still have to make sure that we are, we are developing these habits because research shows that actually females are going to peak their athletic performance and like their mid to late twenties. And that's why you're going to see some more Olympians that are older compared to men, because that's when they've, they've peaked because they've been training and developing these habits. And now they've kind of got their system into a situation that their bot, that their muscles, their neuromuscular system, everything is now caught up to all of these other changes that have occurred in their body. Like I said, it's a long game. You have to give your athlete the tools that she needs to sustain the long game. But if we're trying to get a leg up on everyone super fast and you're like, oh, wow, my athlete looks really slow. All right, I need to do on a program where she's doing basically the same thing that she's doing in practice. You've now just done, you've just added to her sport specific load and you haven't diversified anything. And without diversification, her athleticism won't develop. I think a big, a big question I always have with parents are like, Hey, well, my daughter plays lacrosse. Like now I really want you to work on like her rotation and all this. I'm like, Hey, that's your, that's great. I love that you want me to work, that you want her, those things to improve. My job is to develop her athleticism and her sport. Her lacrosse coach is going to be able to use that foundation and drive those sport specific skills. But if I only do her sport specific movements in here, I'm just adding to that overall fatigue and she actually won't make the improvements as fast as you want them to versus if we treat her as an athlete before the sport player, that's the coach's job. The coach's job is to have your athlete and build a beautiful player out of it. But it's like you're, you're building like a statue out of clay. How much clay do you have? And that's my job. My job is to give you as much clay as possible, as much stuff to work with so you can develop those sport specific skills. So that's great. Thank you for your feedback. We're going to keep driving her power and body awareness and core strength. And heck, the girl is still working on jumping mechanics before I can work on anything else. But thank you for your feedback. And that's where the coach, that's where the sport coach's job is supposed to come in. Um, because again, you have to work on the athlete first. And that's because of how we grow, how these athletes are developing. We need to make sure we develop all of the fundamental qualities of what it means to be an athlete. And then the sport coach can use those qualities to then improve performance. And because we've improved those qualities, we are now are at a lower risk of injury. So it's like, we've given your athlete the best of both worlds, even though her training in here doesn't look like her sport. That's okay. She's doing enough for her sport. You don't have to do that to get better at it. You can keep doing the, what you're doing, but you have to do these other things and that will all contribute to her performance. I love it. And I think that's a great place to end. And I hope you guys learned a lot in this discussion. I am going to include in the caption below previous episodes Emily and I have done on the female athlete growth spurt and also managing sports specific load. And then I will also include an episode I did with registered dietitian Lindsay Cortez, who discusses how to alleviate some of the, the negative menstrual cycle symptoms with nutrition and proper hydration hydration. So some more specific guidance there. Um, but other than that, it really comes down to the basics and just building a strong, nourished and well-rested athlete. So be relentlessly consistent with that. Uh, Emily, thank you again. And all of your information's in the caption below. So guys be able to follow up with Emily. She's a regular guest on the show and has so much to say about female athlete performance training. So Emily, thank you. And we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. See you guys.